So you have a situation like this where you either have one or pa uh, both pale discs. We need to know what to do next. So let's start with two cases to describe. This is a 63-year-old male with blurred vision, known case of hypertensive arthritis spine tuberculosis on AKT for 1.5 years, underwent spine surgery thrice. The ocular examination showed less vision by 624 on N24, color vision defective, amsoglato relative scotoma. So this is the case one, which you can see. You can see a presence of pale disc, which is here. Now let's simultaneously look at one more case. So this is case two, a 50-year-old 50, 50 female with sequential loss of vision, first in the right eye about 1.5 year, uh, years ago, and then la for left eye only four months ago. Diagnosis of optic neuritis was receiving IVMP, was a known case of hypertensive and diabetic mellitus. The IVMP was given only on the basis of this optic neuritis, which showed the presence of one periventricular lesion that you can see, and therefore he was being treated. Now, if you see the vision in the right eye was significantly low because of the already at, at, uh, present optic atrophy of 2 by 60, and left eye was 6 by 24. Pupils were sluggish in both the, react, both the eyes, and you see the classical discs. We can see, as I said, when you are evaluating a disc, always do first on the magnification, and secondly, use a red free. Red free will tell you really the pale looks pa much pale, and the uh, red looks redder. So that helps you differentiate, knowing that the left eye is more than right eye. But note, the amount of pallor does not uh, tell you about the visual acuity. Patient can have a pale disc, but a normal vision. It just tells you whether there is pallor or not. That's all. It doesn't tell you its correlation with the vision. Yes, yeah, so when we have a typical disc appearance, let's check how to detect the etiology. Optic atrophy, you could have any of these changes. Temporal, cupping, arterial attenuation, bota, and peripapillary gliosis. So if you have temporal defect, that is a pallor setting, it could be at a toxic or nutritional neuropathy or an optic neuritis. If there's presence of cupping, you look at an ischemic cause, a toxic cause, or a compressive optic neuropathy. Arterial attenuation, look at ischemia. You also have to look out features like RP-related problems and LHON, which is obviously a poor prognosis. But remember, none of them is pathognomic. These are just guidelines of you to discuss what it could be so you can evaluate and investigate accordingly. A bow tie classically has a contralateral optic tract lesion, and it also can involve the optic chiasma. And peripapillary gliosis, we are looking at post-papillary So to elaborate what I just said, you could either have a bow tie atrophy. What do you mean by bow tie atrophy? You can see the superior and inferior part of the disc is pink. It's only the middle part which is pale. That is called as a bow tie atrophy. And when you have something like this, in the left eye, you have to look at something else. So if it's a left eye, you can see there is a right uh, track lesion. As you can see, right homonymous defect. This is because of craniopharyngema. It is a left optic tract. So this is what will tell you corresponding to your bow tie atrophy. The other aspect is secondary optic atrophy, where you're looking at the muddiness around your optic nerve heads, indicating this is a post papilledema. And an important aspect that if you are looking at an optic atrophy, always look at beyond the disc. Do not forget to see the retina. Like this patient has an entire laser done around PRP. And because of that, there's a consecutive visual fee, uh, optic atrophy that has set in. Now, once we have known that there's an optic atrophy, we have evaluated the disc. Now, let's look at the visual fields and see how you can evaluate. So when you have an optic atrophy, you can do it in three ways. You could either have a central or a centrocecal scotoma. You could have an altitudinal or arcuate or a hemianopia. So central centrocecal scotoma, something like this. You are looking at a toxic or a nutritional cause. In one eye, you are looking at an optic neuritis. On the other hand, it's an altitudinal and arcuate. You're looking at an ischemia cause. You could also have glaucoma, and it could be an optic neuritis. Hemianopia, as I said earlier, it is involving one half of the visual field, which is respecting the vertical meridian. It could be neurological, that is compressive optic neuropathy. So as explained earlier, if it's heteronymous, then you're looking at a chiasmal lesion. If it's homonymous, you're looking at an optic tract lesion. Again, nothing patho uh, pathognomic. You should know if it is so, what are you likely thinking of so that you can investigate on those lines, that is. So now coming back to our cases, which we started, this is a case one who is a patient with hypertension on treatment for AKT. You look at this field. So as you can see, there's a temporal defect. Now you need to go beyond the uh, disc and see, look at the macula more closely. What would you order when you have a thing? A visual field. And when you order a visual field, you see bi bi central scotomas, but they are neither respecting the vertical meridian, not horizontal, hence you have to go anteriorly, look at your disc, which we saw something at the macula. This is a classical bullseye maculopathy. When we did the FFA, we realized that this patient actually had this kind of uh, defect, and this is toxic optic neuropathy. Because the patient was on AKT, it was a ethambutal toxicity. Coming to our case two, where we saw something like this, 
It was a total dyspallor. This patient was being treated for optic neuritis. But what was more important is carefully note the arterial attenuation. That has to not be missed. And as I said, if there's arterial attenuation, you should look carefully for ischemic causes. Get a BP done anytime, every time in OPD. It was 180, 120. So this patient had this particular very ventricular lesion, only one lesion, unlikely to be because of MS for which he was treated. Note that when I said about MS, you should have these ovoid lesions perpendicular to only the periventricular area, which was not in this case. This is just one random one, which is a lacunar infarct. So the actual problem is not related to the MRI, so not to be treated as optic neuritis, but a basic bilateral optic neuropathy status was ischemia. So he needed to just be treated for his hypertension. Then case three, which was a 29-year-old gentleman wearing spectacles since five years, having blurring of vision. Everything looked all right. Had a little, uh, disc had a little issue when I saw carefully. As you can see, there's a little pallor. Again, when you have anything like this with the issue, uh, uh, with the disc, do a visual field analysis, which is a must. And on doing visual field analysis, we got a defect, which is like this. So again, coming to our six questions, this defect is only in one eye. So you are going to be expecting something anterior. This is a left eye superonasal central defect, as you can see here. This central defect is actually related to, we have to go back and look at your optic nerve. And if you see carefully, this is related to a nerve fiber layer defect that you can see. So basically, this is a case of left inferotemporal nerve fiber layer defect, suggestive of glaucoma, and probably NTG. So now Sushma will just tell you something more about NTG, and she'll take the last case. Come. Yeah, so, OK. So again, once again, coming back to the same point, clinical disc evaluation takes the most important thing. There are many a times you can see the nerve fiber layer defects lying there, and the patients have been diagnosed as temporal paler or inferior rim paler and being treated like that. You cannot have a wedge shape and a file, uh, defect in a ischemia or anterior ischemic opt optic neuropathy or optic neuritis. So that has to be evaluated carefully because in this particular patient, it's a young patient, the pressures were normal, it is hard to uh, pick up. But this is a classical sign which can tell you that this is glaucoma or a one-time damage due to glaucoma. That is also a possibility where you can have the normal pressure. So you need to evaluate on the basis of that. So every paler is not always uh, neurological, there can be uh, glaucoma issue. This is one of the overlap case that I will uh, show you. This is a 67-year-old male. Came with sudden diminution of vision in right eye since one day, and that's how uh, came to Jyoti on examination. Vision was right eye was 3 by 60, and left eye was anyway blind. So he was uh, having ophthalmoparesis in the right eye, and there were um, uh, suggestive of Tolosa Hunt syndrome. MRI uh, showed Tolosa Hunt syndrome. So we, they were wondering why he has a sudden loss in the vision because 3 by 60 vision. But uh, when we take the history, this was a known case of glaucoma was on AGM in the right eye and having undergone glaucoma surgery in the left eye in 2007. When you look at carefully gonioscopy and uh, chamber, uh, you know, the anterior segment, there were YAG PIs there, patient had narrow angles, was a case of angle closure glaucoma. Uh, and the previous day vision recorded was 636 and now he came with 3 by 60. So uh, since the optometrist saw the vision and sent that sudden loss of vision, there was left eye RAPD. That was uh, because the left eye was blind. And this is how the nerve looked like. So if you look at the fields here, this is a 24-2 advanced damage. You do a 10-2, and this is how it is. So actually, this is advanced glaucoma. And in such patients, when they're evaluating vision, particularly when there are fixation involved, unless the, your optometrist is uh, having enough patience to allow patient to read from the tempo, residual temporal field, they would not be able to assess the visual acuity consistently as the same. And in uh, angle closure type of glaucoma, when they have a uh, sudden increase in the pressure, they can actually present like uh, discs with the anterior ischemic optic uh, neuropathy. They look more pale than uh, having cups because there is a sudden increase in the pressure. That can also happen in patients with neovascular glaucoma, that uh, the patients who experience a sudden increase in the pressure. And also we need to understand that there is a possibility of coexisting of uh, certain diseases where the neurological and glaucoma cases can coexist. And we need to take care of both. So uh, to end, um, I think we need to correlate clinically, take a proper history, connect the dots, and then make the diagnosis before we decide treating a patient and look only at one aspect. 
thank you so much you've been a wonderful audience <laughs> we could uh, rush through all the presentations i think we have 5 minutes where we can have questions yeah. before we start the next one yeah. Uh, she one minute she had a question which we had yeah can you give her the mic please i will explain it sir um thank you very much uh, for these wonderful presentations. Now it's on the differential diagnosis, differentiating the optic disc edema. Yeah. Um, for the optic neuritis, when you were talking about the MOG and the aquaporin 4, yeah. um, could you please differentiate further? Because I know there are two different entities, you know, beyond just looking at the optic disc, because they are not the same from what I understand. Is there, are there ways in which to further differentiate them? Because we know they have different outcomes yes, so at the end of the day. Yes, three very important. Uh, in NMO, you have uh, 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 intractable hiccup and vomiting is very commonly seen in patients with NMO, which you don't see in patients with MOG. MOG patients can have presence of disc hemorrhage. So if you have a disc hemorrhage, very commonly. Secondly, they respond wonderfully to steroids. That's why initially the chronic uh, relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy, uh, neuropathy was considered as now as MOG. Yeah. So when you treat them with uh, steroids, they'll immediately respond in a day or two, which will neither happen with optic neuritis or MS, or it will happen with NMO. So that's the reason how you differentiate. Secondly, the MRI scan is very, very specific. In case of MOG, you'll have the perineural sheath as well as a fat which gets enhanced in patients, unlike the, the, unlike the NMO. And in case of NMO, you have longer segments. In MOG, you'll have short segments. Optic and sometimes, spine. yes, not spines, along the optic nerve head. Okay. And you may have chiasmal involvement very commonly in terms of MOG with bilateral involvement. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just to answer your question, false positive means when the patient has not seen the stimulus but press the button, which can happen because of the sound effect or the consistent effect that they keep pressing the buttons. False negative means patient has seen the stimulus but not press the button. But how the machine knows if that because uh, at the same location, patient would have responded to a lower stimuli. And when you present a higher stimuli at the same uh, point or the same stimuli, patient does not respond. So that is why it comes as false negative. And that's why we ignore false negatives when there is advanced damage because there is a significant depression. Sir, 20% and 33%, as I said. Less than 20% is what it should be. More than 33%, you have to uh, do the fields again in terms of false negative. Similar is for false positive. You can take it as a yeah, less than 20% is acceptable. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. Could yeah. you tell us something about uh, post vaccination optic? Neuropathy and yeah, treatment. Post vaccination, because optic we have neuropathy. Seen. Yeah. We, okay, Jyoti. We have seen some That's cases. That's for you. Sorry. Yes. Post vaccination, optic neuropathy. That's the last one because we have to give this uh, next session. Yes. Yeah, so post vaccination, uh, optic neuritis is very commonly in children. Uh, they come with sudden loss of vision, but within three days they respond. So this kind of post-infectious, post-vaccination is something which comes as bilateral, it's anterior, and disappears with very good outcome, and mostly seen in children. That's one and aspect of it. I'm sorry, no treatment, Treat no it just treatment. gets treated on its own. Yeah, but I've seen in adults also, like unilateral. Yes, if you're able to uh, tell that it's unilateral, then yes, in, um, if you're able to rule out all the other causes, or as I said, a normal MRI scan is important because you need to see that it's not. Then a course of steroids can be done to prevent it from recurring. Yes.